1965, talking about how many transistors you could pack into a square inch. And uh, if you take the logarithm of the number of transistors uh, per square inch versus time, you get a straight line, and I've plotted it here. I've also, this is only up till now. And of course, I've, I've plotted two more 50-year periods, uh, extrapolating that straight line. Um, both Hans and Ray believe that this extrapolation is, is um, an underestimate, that in fact it will go up faster than this. So uh, that in itself, this green line might even be an exponential. I, I personally doubt that, but that's not, that's, that's up to my panel to discuss. Um, uh, this is an astounding fact that is held true now for some 50 years. And if other aspects, uh, other sort of generalized Moore's laws uh, come in, such as not only how many transistors you can pack into a square inch, but how many calculations you can do per second, and so forth and so on. There's also the flip side, how much it costs to manufacture these things. But again, my panel will discuss that. Um, and. Uh, uh, so one, one has rather amazing uh, predictions as to what might happen. I, want, I would point out that Ray generalizes the, the concept of Moore's Law saying that when one technology gives out, another technology comes in and replaces it just in time. So that even when transistors uh, go the way of all flesh, so to speak, uh, we, will, <laughs> we will have other technologies stepping in to, take, to, to keep the pace going. Uh, it's a fascinating hypothesis. Needless to say, it's an empirical hypothesis. It's not something somebody's going to prove rigorously. Uh, I was, uh, I, I'm not going to try to describe their scenarios. That would take too much time, and they will do a very eloquent job of, of describing those scenarios. I will simply say that uh, I was worried because I cling to the idea of humanity as uh, a kind of a beautiful and sublime thing. And the idea of uh, a, a very, very rapid transition within a century where, in fact, essentially all of us would become uh, things of the past within a hundred years. Uh, our, the whole notion of the human condition would sort of recede into, the, into, the, uh, into history. That struck me as awfully fast. I don't, I'm not claiming that, this couldn't con that these scenarios couldn't come, to, uh, come into being. Uh, the question is how fast, and 100 years frightened me enormously. Uh, I, I, uh, I assembled a panel about a year ago at Indiana University on this topic. I didn't feel as if I got very, uh, a great deal of enlightenment from my panel, although I very much wanted to. I've tried to assemble a new panel to see if I can get more enlightenment. My motivation, <laughs> my motivation is quite selfish. I want to know what, what the time scale is, and uh, so that's why I put my panel together. Uh, that it helps you too, uh, that's just a side effect. Uh, <laughs> So Stanford indulged my selfishness with $12,000, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, I want to mention that the New York Times came out uh, at the end of 1999 with a so-called Times capsule, uh, which was to be opened in the year 3000, okay, by human beings. I really wonder... <laughs> I really wonder whether there will be human beings, and I'm not talking about the end of humanity from nuclear war or pestilence of the ordinary type. I'm talking about the replacement, as mentioned in the title of the symposium, by something else. Uh, I really wonder. Um, one, can, uh, one can talk about how fast things are going, and one can always be a, a, a make a denial. The chess players were making denials. Uh, you see the red line. This is the United States Chess Federation rating of the best computer program in the world. Roughly, I don't know if I've got it exactly right, but you get the point. I saw a graph like this in Scientific American some years ago at about 1995, and it extrapolated a crossing of the green line, which is roughly the level of the human best player in the world. It extrapolated it to around 1998 or so, 19, you know, 2000. And a lot of the chess players said, oh, no, 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 this line is going to bend over, and it's always going to stay below that green line. Well, it didn't. It didn't. And the only reason it hasn't gone above that line is that uh, IBM retired. But it will go above that line soon, and you'll be able to buy, a, you know, for $5, a program that can beat any human being shortly. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of naysayers out there, uh, but I think you have to be worried. Or maybe optimistic, as some people are. Uh, 
there are people who are, are naysayers, uh, such as John Searle. Uh, and, and here's a, a kind of a naysaying about the... Uh, <laughs> I want to. I just want to point out the idea. One could also be negative about the idea that life could have trans, could have migrated out of the sea. I mean, after all, it might have seemed fantastic to fish at that time, as it says here. You can't even breathe. Uh, ribbit, ribbit. Uh, well, there are naysayers around. As I said, I always take on John Searle. Uh, so here we have John Searle on the left. Sentient life in silicon don't make me laugh. Wrong causal powers, just syntax, no semantics, blah, blah, blah. The idea is self-contradictory, don't you worry. And on the right, robot, robot. <laughs> I think that one came out of Ponce's laboratory at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, all right, life has evolved. To me, it seems far, far more implausible that life would evolve out of insentient that, in other words, oh. sentient matter or animate matter would evolve out of inanimate matter, then that it would change substrate. To me, changing of substrate is very big, but having it happen at all is much bigger. The big part has already taken place, and animals have migrated, has migrated from the sea to the land. Maybe it can migrate in other ways. Now, I want to bring up two scenarios here that are of concern. Uh, one is uh, the one that I originally formulated my symposium concerning, and the other is what Bill Joy's article was about. Uh, my symposium was concerned with the scenarios that set out in Hans's and Ray's books, uh, and I have that written there, the sort of the high IQ end of humanity scenario, so if we're left in the dust by our techno progeny. Uh, Bill Joy's concern is somewhat different, but it's intimately related. And that's the low IQ end of humanity scenario. That is, we're smothered by self-reproducing technodust. Uh, and I'm sure Bill can articulate this far better than I did in five words uh, or whatever. But that is in a, it, it's trying to capsulize two different worries. Uh, my symposium was largely about this, but I'm sure we will be talking about this as well. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. I want to say one last thing about evolution. Part of the scenarios that are described, particularly in these books, is the scenario of artificial evolution basically making us cognitive scientists irrelevant. That is, we can think as much as we want to about how thought works, but nobody was out there doing cognitive science designing our brains. Our brains got designed by evolution, which is just basically a tooth and claw fight uh, for survival. Why couldn't that happen again uh, within the medium of the silicon or other media, uh, whatever it might be? Uh, and the idea is that we wouldn't need us cognitive scientists around to figure out the principles by which minds and brains work. It'll just evolve by itself. That's kind of a scary thought to me as well. Uh, and in fact, to me, the whole thing is not exactly a question of whether, it's a question of if. One of the, of when, <coughs> sorry. The, um, the original title that I made for this symposium was Who Will Be We in 2093? Uh, I also had thought of another title, and it made me more comfortable, which was Who Will Be We in 2493? So that's really the, what this is all about. And um, I, I will now uh, hand it over to Ray, who, uh, uh, who will talk for uh, 25 minutes or less. Uh, and, uh, and then we will go on to Bill Joy and then on to Hans, and then we'll have a break. <laughs>